Grant Vertigal, is that right? Even pronounce his right, name right. And he's going to talk to us today about local invasive plants, right? With what's going on with that. And uh, he's going to talk about local plants. So it's not like what do you see in Maine, It'll be what we have here locally. And also some of the control methods that we uh, could have in a place. Now then, in October, there's going to be a follow-on AT where Grant is going to go and take people around. It'll be at Thrive Park. So be watching Plan Your Week, the website, however you get your social media, however you get your uh, uh, news. But Grant's going to lead a, one in October at Thrive, identifying uh, plants where you can actually see what it is. So people like me that are real visual, okay, that works out really uh, well. So that would be a good thing if you're interested. So be watching for that. It'll be at Thrive Park sometime in October. So Grant works for the uh, city of Louisville. And you're a forestry and horticultural technician? Okay. And he does Leela, Thrive, and then there's some other parks scattered around uh, Louisville, if I'm not mistaken. So you're a California boy. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I, I didn't say anything ugly. I didn't say anything ugly. But uh, he studied at uh, Cal State, uh, what, plant health? And Reedley College, I never have heard of Reedley, but Forestry and Natural uh, Resources. He worked at the uh, Kern and Pixley uh, Wildlife uh, Refuge, and he was focusing on the removal of salt cedar. And the reason that they were uh, doing that is they were trying to restore habitat there, so that's always a good thing. And so the uh, endangered species of San Joaquin kit fox and the Tipton kangaroo rat. There might be some of those in my backyard. So we have that. But I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to uh, Grant. Uh, as said previously, I'm Grant Vertigal. Um, I work for the city of Louisville in the Parks and Rec Department. Um, a lot of my work is at Leela. Um, that's where the focus is. With my background of plant health and plant science and working uh, I worked a little bit on the East Coast doing some invasive species removal for a company called um, IPC, Invasive Plant Control. It's where I learned a lot of what I did. Um, we worked in national parks, state parks, uh, wildlife refuges, and we learned how to control just about everything. So bringing that here, um, I was excited to be able to come into the area and see what invasives we had and how we might be able to control it. So I found, I believe it's a top 10 list of our invasives that we're dealing with specifically at Leela, but that are spread out throughout Louisville. You know, there's hundreds of invasives all throughout, um, and some are ranked higher up on priority than others. But these are the top 10 that we are seeing have a stronger foothold within our area or um, are definitely ones that we have focused on in the past that we're trying to finish our eradication of. So what are invasive species? Um, essentially, an invasive species is defined as a species that is non-native uh, to the ecosystem under consideration and whose introduction causes or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. Uh, I do promise they're not all long slides like this. It's just the bulk of the information is at the front. Um, an invasive species is an organism such as plants, animals, and insects that are not native to the region and pose a threat the native organisms. Invasive plants have been introduced in a variety of ways, most common being government subsidized erosion control like kudzu or escaped ornamentals, things like uh, privet. Uh, these plants grow, reproduce, and spread rapidly, which allows them to establish over large areas. Species that become invasive typically succeed due to favorable environmental conditions and lack of natural competitors and diseases that would normally regulate their populations in their native ecoregions. Yet again, kudzu is a huge plant taken over the south, but in its native area of, I believe, Japan, it's well in control. There's plenty of other species that are able to kind of outcompete it and help regulate it. Um, they become a problem by pushing out the native plants, which eliminated diversity needed to regulate against disease. Uh, this also is a problem because they eliminate the natural food sources for the animals, birds, and insects. Thus, when local fauna turn to eating the invasive plants, they inadvertently spread these seeds through their digestive tracts. 
Um, and invasive species are a significant threat to almost half of the native US species currently listed as federally endangered. Please do your part to save these endangered species and protect your ecosystem by planting natives and removing invasives whenever possible. So as I talked, kudzu is a huge problem. It's well known in the uh, Southeast. It has taken over. In fact, it's been dubbed the plant that ate the South. Um, this is actually in Virginia at a National Wildlife Refuge. When I was in the East Coast working with IPC, uh, there was 25 acre area there that had been completely taken over by kudzu. Um, and we got contracted out knowing full well that it's a multi-year project. Most invasive species take five years to really get a solid control on. And this was our first year going out there. Um, so in this first video, you kind of see the all over the trees and all over the ground, how much it has taken up. And these little roads were actually cut through for us to be able to kind of break them up in sections to go and treat. Um, this next video is us using a uh, foliar application. We were using a uh, four wheeler with a 70 gallon tank and dual wheel sprayers, dual reel sprayers. So we're able to go up and down these rows spraying the herbicide on there and it took effect really well. Um, and then that last picture over there is uh, yet again, just more of it. And you can see it just climbing up the trees, taking over, which is a problem as it will start to pull down on the trees and start to kill them. Um, so one invasive at we have at Leela is the Chinese tallow. Um, it's a deciduous tree reaching 60 feet tall in height. These are all alternate heart shapes, two to three inches long with the pointed tip, which you can see in the bottom corner over there. Uh, the flowering occurs from April to June. Uh, the flowers are yellowish and occur in eight inch long uh, dangling spikes. And you can see an example of that in the picture there. Um, it has three lobed greenish fruit that are found in clusters at the end of branches. Um, we actually have this at Leela. One of our trails, uh, we had a couple of trees that had been killed, I believe about two years ago. And we went walking through the other day and we found at least 80 little new shoots popping up everywhere. So what it was two big trees that were going to continue to spread their seeds. Now, even though that they've been cut down, we have a little bit of residual from the roots that were still there. But a lot of it was the seeds that had just fallen and taken effect and even through the birds. And these will continue to spread throughout Leela until we get a control on them. Uh, some of the tools of the trade, these are some of the more fun tools to use. <laughs> um, a lot of these are used for your trees and your brush. Uh, we have the middle and the far picture with me in it are the uh, brush saws that we use. It's essentially a weed eater with a saw blade on it. It works great on dealing with stuff like privet um, or multiflora rose, which I treated a lot on the East Coast. You don't want to have to get in there if it's all thorny and whatnot. So it's easy to go in and cut the bottoms out and clear it away. Um, some other tools, more hand tools, you know, loppers, even machete works well. Um, there's a treatment called hack and squirt, which you go around the base and create essentially break up and open the cambium layer and then spray in some herbicide. Um, it's an effective method. It's a little slower than dropping the whole tree, but sometimes you don't want to leave a whole bunch of dead trees laying on the ground. You just want to kill the tree at its source. <laughs> Another example of an invasive is the, uh, China berry. It's a deciduous tree that's 50 feet tall, uh, alternate lacy, dark green, uh, twice or thrice compounding leaves, uh, small fragrant lilac flowers, um, single seeded, yellowish to yellowish, yellow to yellowish green uh, round fruit. Um, yet again, you can see all the fruit that comes off of that tree. That is all more seeds that are going to spread. And with things like this, sometimes you got to cut them down. Sometimes you do an herbicide treatment. And sometimes you just got to get in and kind of give it a little hack and squirt and kill it right there. Um, it's a picture of me working in the Anacostia River. Um, in the background, or I guess in front of me, you can see some Phragmites in the river. Um, this was actually behind a golf course right in the middle of the river. We spent about two days going out there. We used the John boats to push across our stuff with the tide was up high. And we'd go in and do an herbicide treatment. The year previous, they had used the brush saws to cut through and then did a um, treatment at the base. But with root system like Phragmites that is compounding, it's hard to get control and stuff like that. Uh, here's the Chinese pistache. Um, it looks similar 
to the uh, soap berry, but it lacks that end leaf on the um, set. Um, we actually have some of these out at Leela, but a more, a greater population of this is actually at Thrive Nature Park. Um, and it's one of the ones that we're gonna be focusing on our treatment of removing there. Um, and as you can see, these actually have the uh, autumn shift from the green to red, kind of making it. And then you can see that um, the small red seed pods that turn blue in the fall, it's more stuff just to be spread through birds and other animals. Same day of the Anacostia River, I got stuck in the mud and it took about a half an hour to get me to dig out. The work's not always glamorous, but it's rewarding when at the end of the day, you can see everything that you've killed or even a couple months later when you come back and you see, yes, it's a lot more empty, but the natives that are starting to pop up and you don't see that big wall of Phragmites or Privet or Wisteria. <laughs> Uh, the calorie pear is a common ornamental plant. It's sold in garden centers. It's also known as a Bradford pear. Um, and this is a prime example of ornamentals that have escaped. Um, and they get spread through their seeds and birds carry them away. And as a result, they start to spread more. And it's the same thing as like a crepe myrtle. It's not native. It's considered invasive. It's not as high of a priority for us right now, because it's a little more obvious, people are easier to see, so they get, kind of get taken care of a lot quicker. The calorie pear is a little less conspicuous, making it easier to kind of blend in with the other trees, making it sometimes harder to miss. But once you know what it looks like, it's easy to see. Um, this, this, I got to work, and this is probably one of my favorite sites that I got to treat at uh, the Delaware Water Gap National Park. Um, we had done some tre treatment treatment there previously in the year, um, there was actually an endangered turtle nesting ground that they had contracted us to kind of get rid of some of the invasives that were starting to encroach on that area. So we got to do that. Um, but then we followed up with a week of treatment of herbicide along the stream bed um, using water safe herbicides. And then I left before I got a chance to go back, but it was the week after I left and came back to California, they got to go in and they cut everything out of there. Um, they were doing some major changing of the landscape there. They were trying to make it more natural, less guided in the way the riverbed was going to be. It was more pond-like is what they were trying to develop. And they didn't want to spread the invasives when they were going in moving the dirt. So they wanted us to come in and do that first initial, essentially just shock and awe of killing as many invasives as we could so that it wouldn't spread and make the problem worse. Um, Chinese and Japanese privet are both very common um, plants to be seen, especially around here. This is the Japanese um, privet. It's a evergreen shrub that can grow up to 20 foot tall. It's a uh, multi-trunk. Um, leaves are opposite, oval and two inch long with a pointed apex. Um, Flowering occurs in spring to summer, uh, and the white flowers occur in clusters at the end of branches. Um, its cousin, the Chinese privet, is a semi-evergreen shrub or small tree that grows up to 20 feet tall in height. It's a little smaller, more shrub-like than the Japanese, but these are both very common problems. Um, the reason that these are such a problem is I'm sure you've walked along and just seen walls of privet and they start to push out all the natives right there. It takes away food for the deer and other wildlife. And as it pushes them out, you lose that biodiversity that we really need within that ecosystem. So it comes down to, you know, your main trees are left, but what happens when a disease or an insect comes in that, you know, the emerald ash borer, if the Japanese or Chinese privet pushed out almost everything besides the ash trees and the emerald ash borer came in, you're going to have a problem because all you're going to have left after a couple of years is just privet. So finding the way to control these invasives and get a head start on it before it becomes a secondary or residual problem um, is better. Um, here's some of my work at uh, the Kern National Wildlife Refuge, removing salt cedar. Um, the entire refuge had been kind of taken over. They had some big flooding, spread the seeds. These, I believe, produce, I want to say it's 6,000, it might have even been 60,000 seeds a year. So it is a huge problem with the spreading and it is very hardy tree and hard to kill. It's multi-trunked. As you can see in the middle picture, 
that was probably one of the biggest trees that we had at the refuge and it was a good 25 foot tall and some of those limbs got really large but then they started off small and you just have clusters of little salt cedars popping up and with each salt cedar you have spread of more um, seeds and we we're removing these as mentioned to kind of create the habitat for the endangered San Joaquin kit fox and the Tipton kangaroo rat, which had become very kind of pushed out, um, especially by the raptors that like to perch in these tall salt cedars and then prey on the kangaroo rats. Uh, Heavenly bamboo or Nandina, another one sold common at the garden centers. Um, it takes over and it can has a ton of seeds which get spread very easily. Um, while they do typically they don't typically flower and seed if they're singular units kind of spread out, but when they become these clustered units, that's when they become the problem. You have four or five of the plants there, they start producing the seeds. That's four or five plants worth of seeds being distributed through wildlife. Um, and a lot of garden centers and nurseries don't understand that this is actually an invasive. This last weekend, I went to a little garden center near me and I was looking around for some plants wanting to plant more natives and that was sitting there and I had a conversation with one of the employees explaining that this is a problem yeah it looks great the change of color from the winter to the, to the summer and the new growth turning red that it looks wonderful but is it worth it if it's just going to become a problem and start spreading and causing more residual problems uh, more salt cedar removal um, this middle picture isn't the best way to treat it, but we had limited down to hand tools. So it was just trying to get it down, knowing that there is most likely gonna have regrowth off of there, but the regrowth is easier to treat with a foliar application than trying to do a foliar application of a giant tall salt cedar tree. Eventually we did get trained on our chainsaws. So we were able to get certified and be able to go in there. Queen Anne's lace, very common and it is going to spread everywhere because of the little seeds that like to cling to everything. A uh, problem I have is my boot laces. I always have to make sure that before I go into a, one of our um, pocket prairies, I make sure that I'm not carrying the seeds on my boot laces because they like to cling to it. But we did do a trial at Thrive Nature Park of running through that area with blankets and collecting the seeds to help kind of cut down on the redistribution and we are very thankful for those people who are able to go out there and do that. Uh, Japanese honeysuckle, it is a vine and it might not be a more obvious plant, but it'll yet again, it starts to take over, climb up things, um, has these, the flowers there, it has the, I think it is alternating leaves um, and there are bilobe flowers, uh, ov ovate, ov oblong ovate, uh, about one to three inches long we, uh, leaves. Um, this is something that you can easily go in with uh, hand clippers. If you start seeing it, that's tiny little um, vine is easier to kill smaller. General rule of thumb I was always taught was if it's smaller than your pinky, you don't have to treat it with herbicide once you cut it. So with something like this, if you're on, constantly on it, you start seeing some, you cut, the, cut it down at the base, you lose its effectiveness to regrow. It's not going to be able to survive as much. Now, if it was a bigger plant, I would obviously recommend doing an herbicide treatment after cutting it, just because it has more potential for it to come back. Uh, these photos are actually not of me, courtesy of Jonathan. Uh, we have nodding thistle and bastard cabbage management. Um, more hand removal, removing the tops. You know, if, if you can't go in and completely remove the plant, sometimes the best thing to do is to remove the seed head so that it doesn't keep on coming back. And Johnson grass. It is everywhere and almost impossible to control because of the way the root system is set up and the, where, the way it just gets spread through contract mowers coming in or landscapers or just people not cleaning off their equipment, moving from one site to another. Uh, the seeds like to spread very easily. These can be controlled with selective herbicides or repetitive mowing or even grazing. Goats are a wonderful biocontrol method for a lot of invasive plants. Uh, they'll be able to go through and eat a lot. They use that at the uh, National Wildlife Refuge in Virginia for a little bit to control some of the kudzu. 
Um, if you get that repetitive grazing, you stop its ability to continue to spread. In fact, you actually help the control and the elimination of it. And then here is some giant reed. Um, this was at Pixley National Wildlife Refuge. It had goes along the little creek bed there. And while our goal wasn't the removal of it, it was the control. Since it was along a creek bed, it's hard to stop that and get rid of it completely, especially if there are parent pockets further up the creek or up the stream. But if you can at least eliminate your site from being a host of seed to continue downriver, then it does a huge helping there. Uh, we were using brush saws and herbicide to treat the tops of the cuts once we had gotten through. Um, and this is an example of compounding effects. In the late 1700s, the tree of heaven was brought over from China to the US as a fast growing shade tree. Uh, the tree of heaven has the ability to reproduce extremely fast, grow rapidly in many adverse conditions, and can take over an area. This can and does directly result in the killing of native plants and decreasing biodiversity. If you improperly kill the tree of heaven, if you go in and try to do a hack and squirt treatment or a girdling of it, and it doesn't take effect, the tree of heaven, I like to say it becomes angry and sends out a ton of its little kids to grow in its place. So one tree now becomes 20. Um, today, the tree of heaven is a host for another invasive species, the spotted and lanternfly. There aren't just plants that are the invasives. I used to work at the county at commissioner's office back in California, where I trapped for invasive insects, uh, wanting to make sure that we did not get them into our county since we were a large agricultural county and did a lot of exporting. We didn't want to spread that, so we always had traps up in our fields. A spotted lanternfly is a major problem in Pennsylvania. Uh, it causes around $324 million of damage annually. They actually have a hotline that if you are over there and you see it, to call them and let them know and they will go out and monitor for it. Uh, when I had left the Delaware Water Gap, we were kind of driving through and even though it's the main problem in Pennsylvania, it's the surrounding states that are, are getting the effects too. I actually was able, we stopped to kind of look at some sites and I saw one there, was able to catch it and kill it. And I would call it in to report it because even though it was just one that I saw, there's going to be a ton more that I didn't see. Uh, the spotted lanternfly is a plant hopper native to South Asia and believed to have been introduced to the US through shipments of stone fruit. Uh, it uses its piercing sucking mouth part to feed on sap from over 70 different plant species. It has a strong preference for economically important plants, including grapevines, maple trees, black walnut, birch, willow, and other trees. So you can see how this is a problem. The invasive tree is a host for the invasive insect that likes to feed on and result in killing of native trees. So just because it's the plant doesn't mean that it's just the plant there. There are other compounding effects that come with it. So really, what can you do to help? Shop local, buy native. When you go in to buy and even talk to your landscapers or your neighbors or whatever, and they have landscapers, make sure that they're not planting invasive plants. Make sure you're asking what's native and what's invasive and staying away. So if you know ahead of time, hey, um, Nandina is invasive, you might, they might not know it at the garden center, but if you go in, just know not to buy the Nandina. So kind of know some of your local invasives that are really impactful and try to stay away from them. Um, take only memories, leave only footprints. Um, when you come into an area, you should try to make sure not to bring anything that you could have in your garden into that area. In the same way, when I leave a trail, I wanna make sure I'm not carrying seeds with me before I go home and bring them into my garden. Uh, boot brushes are simple things to be kept in your car. Just do a quick wipe off of your feet. At Lilo, we're in the um, process of introducing boot brush stations with little signs just pretty much asking that, you know, we don't want what's in your garden. You don't want what's in ours. Please wipe your feet before and after leaving or hiking our trail. And it cuts down immensely on the spread of these seeds of these invasives. Spread the word. Not everyone knows about invasive species. In fact, a lot of people don't, and they don't understand the importance and the damage that they cause. Um, so I, I make it my mission that whenever I'm talking to people about what I do for work, I explain to them the impact that the invasive species have and kind of give them examples, things that they might commonly know. Mandina, crepe myrtle, calorie pear. Those are all common things that you're going to find planted even around your local shopping malls 
that are visual to the public that if you're like, hey, this is actually an invasive, then they're going to become more aware and not going to go home and plant that themselves in their yard. Um, lend a helping hand. Volunteer at your local parks to help remove invasives. Our goal is to get an invasive crew, essentially of volunteers who can help us with the, some of the smaller projects on doing it on their own, or even the big projects. Thrive Nature Park is going to be a huge project to remove a lot of those privet walls that have developed there. And we're gonna need as many helpers and volunteers as possible to be able to do that. And that's a huge way to help. Even if you just are walking through and keep your eyes out and notice, hey, I'm noticing a lot of invasives in this area. Just simply letting people know who are taking care of that area. So it kind of gets on their radar. Not everyone knows about invasives, even the people who take care of those areas. And if they know, hey, that's invasive, they might start taking it upon themselves to start removing it so that it stops the spread as well. And as I mentioned, we are doing an in-person ID and training of more hands-on specifically how to kill a lot of these plants. Um, the information is here and we have a sign-up sheet in the back if you would like any information or would like to attend. Um, we're gonna walk around Thrive Nature Park um, I'll bring a couple of other examples of stuff that we don't have readily available on the trail there. Make sure that there are no seeds attached and I'm going to get rid of it immediately after. But um, these are going to be the ones that we're going to be focusing on killing at Thrive and Leela. And it's all worth it because we have helped save the wildlife. In the far corner, that is a kangaroo rat. I believe that's a Hearman's kangaroo rat, which is also common there. It was the more common species at the refuge and its cousin, the Tipton, is slightly smaller, I believe, and that was the only difference. This thing hopped around. I tried to catch it to give an ID. They're faster than you think. <laughs> uh, the middle picture is a little baby cotton tail um, that I was able to save when cutting down a salt cedar. It kind of got scared, ran off, and sat in the middle of the road, and I was watching the raptors kind of chase after it, so I was able to pick it up and relocate it to a brushed area. <laughs> And then here uh, we're working at a uh, county park in Virginia and there's a family of deer just sitting right there watching us. And it's nice when you're able to see the wildlife that you're helping to take care of. And then more, more pictures. Um, a lot of these were taken throughout my time over on the East Coast. And it's a nice way that even on those hot days that you're just tired of cutting down the trees or spraying the herbicide, you got to go find things like this and be like, this is why I'm doing it. Um, and that's it. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, yeah. So question from Gene Mason. Are crepe myrtles invasive? It depends on where you're at and what, because what can be listed as invasive here depends on, so it's all situational on what area you're in, but there are some areas that do list crepe myrtles as invasive. Other question from uh, Elizabeth Reed. Are the herbicides to use based upon the specific plant and which herbicides are recommended for home use? Um, some are based on the specific plant. When we did the kudzu treatment, we chose a kudzu specific herbicide so as not to kill anything that was underneath it. Um, only problem was, is it was a legume specific herbicide and we were right next to a field of soybeans. So we had to be careful there, but a lot of just general broadleaf herbicides or um, just even just general herbicides will work well. And just any, you can go to Home Depot or wherever and pick up some and treat them in your yard. Uh, we might use a more selective or a higher concentrate of it if we're dealing with a heavy population. Question from Cecily. Japanese honeysuckle is listed in Rick Lennox's range plants of North Central Texas. Is it invasive or just something to avoid? Um, so Japanese honeysuckle is considered invasive, especially along the East Coast. And yet again, it's very situational on where you're at, on where they're listed as invasive or just plants to avoid. So it, there are some resources out there to find a uh, what is listed under what county or what region or state as invasive. Kisa, are the high concentration vinegars okay to use? Yes, I actually use an herbicidal vinegar at one of my parks. We're um, getting rid of Japanese stiltgrass and a, it was a wide open field and there was a lot of native plants and 
milkweed there. So we use the um, herbicidal vinegar as a topical control on the baby stilt grass. But once it reaches a certain point, I think it's like the third leaf or something like that on the grass or certain areas, it no longer becomes as effective since it just deals with that top and not the systematic. From Brian, is most invasive miss human initiated? Yes. Uh, whether it's inverted but or human initiated, 90% of it will be human initiated. The insects tend to be more inadvertent, um, but a lot of them are golden garden centers because they look nice and people want to buy them. Bamboo, everyone wanted to plant bamboo, but it's invasive and it takes over. Um, so just be careful what you are planting yourself. From Gene, the best control for frag mites along water. So with that one, you're going to try to find a uh, water safe herbicide. Um, I think Diquat is water safe herbicide and it works well on that. Um, I cannot specifically remember what we used at that treatment, but just kind of read your labels and understand what you're spraying to make sure you're doing it safely. From Fritz, King Ranch blue stem is a curse around here. Are you familiar with it? <laughs> yes, I am. I try not to put a lot of the grasses up here because grasses are harder to identify. Johnson grass is easy to identify, but there's a lot um, of grasses that are harder to distinguish between the native and the invasive. And so as a result, unless you're really familiar with your plant anatomy, they kind of become hard to teach people. Another question about grasses from Becky. How best to eliminate Dallas grass? Uh, herbicide, that's the best. We do, we do it at Leela. We'll find little patches in our area. And we just try to spray it right there and do a concentrated treatment of it. Okay, from Diane, what concentration of vinegar? Um, I believe Home Depot is an example. They sell 33% concentrate. It's higher than your distilled white vinegar at home. But if you have a small little thing and you want to go pour that into the soil around it, it'll help kind of kill it. But if you're going to do a, a foliar application, try to go with the higher concentrate. Mm -hmm. From Elizabeth, is it best to spray the plant or cut the plant and apply herbicide to the cut part? It's, or is this plant specific? It's plant specific too. A lot of your more shrubby stuff, Lespedeza is another plant that I can't go through and cut a whole bunch of little tops and then spray it. Same thing with the honeysuckle, you could do a foliar. And if I went through and cut every single vine and treated every single thing, it becomes a more time consuming. Trees, 100%. Go in, cut them, do a cut some treatment. Um, bushes at to a certain height, general rule of thumb, you should never want to spray above your head. So anything that you can cut at that point is better. But if you can't, do a, a, a very selective herbicide treatment. That's all we have from the remote audience right now. I have a bunch of questions, and I will start with you. Mm -hmm. Yes. So Grant, can for you those repeat on the your question or yeah, summarize for it? For those on the Zoom, um, it was asked about the reed wrenches used to be used to remove the privets out at Leela, um, but it left the root system intact. Now we're going in and cutting it. Are we using a cut and paint method or a um, essentially a cut and paint method? Yes, we are. Whenever I go in and cut anything, I have a concentration of a 50% triclopyr and 50% water, which is a good solid number percentage to use to take care of that. And on a larger tree beyond privet, I'll just do the cambium layer, but anything small enough just to spray the whole thing, I make sure to do that. We have, we have one behind you right there. I think he has a, yeah, sorry. Well, yes, one of the things you didn't mention anything about was Bermuda grass. Okay, and yeah. obviously Bermuda is an invasive. And everyone seems to have plenty of Bermuda it grows mm -hmm. over everything. Now, is there a safe way or a, an effective way to get rid of it, especially when there are other plants like, like trees or something in the area? 
So when it comes to grasses, you have to use a general herbicide. If you're going to treat, you can't use a broadleaf specific like I would typically if I was doing the inverse of treating a tree or a bush in a grassy area. It has to become down to just the very selective and careful use of herbicide or finding possibly another native or grass that can outcompete it. We're finding that buffalo grass is doing really well, really well within areas and kind of keeping a lot of the invasives out of those little patches. Um, and buffalo grass is a native and it works really well. It is, it is. Are, are you watching out for branch broom rape? It is in Dallas. I mean, it's in Denton and it's north of here and it has quite an agricultural impact. Um, not, I'm still trying to learn a lot of the more specific and localized invasives. A lot of what I know did come from the East Coast. But I'm constantly updating the list and anything I that I find, I add to a list that as a possible concern and ranking them in priority. I would very much like to give you some information on it. It's yeah. on my property and there's not much you can do about it. Yeah, no, I would, I would love to find out more about that. Aaron, do that. I'll go over. I'll go right here. You're close. <laughs> So for a Chinese towel, or do you use girdling, or how are you removing Chinese towel? Girdling can be effective. It's similar to a hack and squirt treatment. Um, we do the cut stump treatment. It's better, in my opinion, just to remove the tree if it's safe to do so, and then do the pain to treatment of the stump. But the Chinese towel that we're finding that's popping up is the little shoots off the ground, less than two foot tall. So we'll do a foliar application of that. So do you, uh, are you coordinating with the uh, city of Carrollton at all? And I'm wondering if we go to city of Carrollton and say, we're gonna start removing Chinese towel, if they're going to be receptive to our advice. Um, I haven't started working with the other cities around. I wanted to develop a good program here so that we have a basis to come in to where if volunteers want to go in or other people want to go into another city, be like, City of Louisville is doing this. It's working really well. If we can build up a solid platform at our area, then it is easier to spread. Yeah, I'm, I'm concerned about going to the city of Carrollton and they're going to say, oh, we don't want you cutting anything out. So yeah, yeah, no, I, I understand that. The city of Denton has a tree giveaway program and they give away not necessarily native, but what they call well adapted species that grow. Mm -hmm. And I got a Chinese pistache from them a few years ago. So should I lop that down or what? Yeah, yeah, I, I would suggest that. Um, and like I said, that's a problem. Not everyone who's in charge knows what the problems are. So letting people know, hey, by the way, this is an invasive, probably shouldn't be giving this one away is a good call. Yeah, so it just, and if you can completely keep the species out, it makes it a whole lot easier. So there's no possibility of cross pollination. Just have one thing to add to your um, things yes. to do list is if you walk with your dog, make sure that you brush his fur because he'll always pick up seeds. I have several little plants left by my dog. That <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. I used to walk through a field that is now developed in, but he would pick up a lot of stuff. Yes. Thank you. Speaking of that field that her dog walks through, <laughs> any uh, experience with grass burrs, sand, sand burrs? Um, I don't have the experience with it. Um, not kind of where, like I said, I worked more in the East Coast, and that's where I got a lot of my training, and we didn't really have that. We're really looking for the right chemical. Yeah. And a couple more from the remote audience. Is there an invasive list online that we can see? Yes. Jonathan might have a couple of good examples back there. He is my crew leader and is a wonderful reference as well. Texasinvasives.org is a great one. And from Thanks. Becky, it would be great to make a regional approach to invasives that plague us all. Yes, I agree. A regional approach would be great. That's why I said if I can help get help starting up a program here, it's easier than trying to go to multiple cities and try to start them all at once. Start at home and spread the word from there. Is there anything else? We have one more back here. You as well. 
What herbicide do you recommend for Chinese printer? Uh, we are using, we're using Cheetah Pro right now, um, which is just our general herbicide that we use on most everything, includes, including our, like our poison ivy control from the trails. Um, you can, it's, yet again, if you do some research onto the plant and find maybe a little bit stronger, but it's always harder too for people at home to get the good chemicals because those are sold through chemical reps to specific departments. But a general herbicide at a high enough concentration should be good to help and repetitive treatments and alternating as well. So don't just keep on using Cheetah Pro on the same plant if it's not dying, maybe try a different chemical. Glyphosate, it, yeah, Jonathan was talking about glyphosate is another good one. And I know glyphosate does have a stigma, but if you use certain brands, they're safer than the Roundup brand. I think we pretty much have got everybody question. Everybody online have had their opportunities. So Grant. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Great job. All right, everybody, thank you so much. That's the end of what we have today. Before you leap up, did you get pictures of the group that was here today? I did. Of everybody that was here. I think that would, I would like to see everybody that was here. After 18 months, I think a little photo documentation would be a good thing. And maybe, Catherine, for the people at home, you could swing the uh, camera around so they have an opportunity to see who all uh, came today. To me, it's a big deal. Thank you very much. Okay, so as far as uh, time goes for today, it'll be uh, 45 minutes or 0.75 hours for uh, BMS and for service. Well, yeah, but when they load it to BMS, it'd be 0.75 for service under chapter meeting. And then under uh, AT, uh, let's go ahead and we'll just make that an hour. Okay, so uh, we'll go with uh, that. So one hour for AT for today, 0.75 hour of service under uh, chapter meeting. And again, thanks to everybody that came. We really appreciate it. See you guys at uh, November at Global Spheres. All right, so take care. Thank you.